Hello everybody and uh, welcome to this ODI webinar on moving away from aid. My name is David Watson, I'm the Director of External Affairs here and we're delighted that you've chosen to join us online virtually today. Uh, a brief introduction to what we're going to do today. I'm just going to uh, say a little bit about who we've got speaking uh, and how the uh, webinar is going to work. So if you're not already familiar with ODI, uh, we're the Overseas Development Institute. We're the largest international development and humanitarian uh, affairs think tank in Europe. We're an independent global think tank working to harness the power of evidence and ideas through research, convening, and policy advice to promote a sustainable and peaceful world where everyone thrives. There's about 200 or so of you online today, so uh, we're hoping to get as many of you involved in the conversation as possible. Uh, but before we go uh, to the actual Q&A part of the webinar, we're going to hear a little bit from one of our ODI experts here, Annalisa Pritzon, uh, who is a senior research fellow here working on development finance. We're joined by three tremendous experts are on the field of uh, moving away from aid and transition. Of course, experts in many other fields as well. Uh, as well. But today, they're going to be speaking about uh, the issue uh, that we're talking about today. So Keith Jeffries, who's the managing director of Eco, Eco, Econsult Botswana, uh, who will be focusing on the experience of Botswana. Uh, Juan Pablo Prado uh, Leande, who is a professor of the Benemerita Universidad Autónoma de Puebla, uh, forgive my uh, Spanish accent, Juan Pablo, uh, focusing on the experience of uh, Mexico. And Olivier Cataneo, who is the uh, head of policy analysis and strategy at the uh, Development Corporation Directorate at the OECD. So today's webinar uh, is going to focus on what to do when development cooperation has succeeded, which is a great thing to be talking about. Uh, we've traditionally uh, focused more on the poorest countries and what to do to make development more effective. But how to handle success and transition to new partnerships is also important uh, as countries prosper and graduate from aid eligibility. Annalisa is going to say a little bit more about the context for her work and the findings of the research that ODI launched on Monday on moving away from aid. But first of all, we're going to talk, uh, first of all, sorry, the, the, the way that we're going to structure uh, the webinar today is Annalisa is going to present the uh, results of her research and talk about some of the lessons learned. We're then going to go uh, to Keith uh, to hear a little bit about the experience of Botswana. Then Juan Pablo will talk to the experience of Mexico, and Olivier will uh, share with us uh, his perspective from the, from the OECD. We will be live tweeting throughout the conversation. Um, encourage you to do the same. Uh, please use the hashtag AwayFromAid. And follow, make sure you're following at ODIDev on Twitter uh, so that you can retweet and engage with the conversation uh, online. So, uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Annalisa, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about the research we launched on Monday on moving away from aid. Thank you very much, David, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, but also good morning and good evening. I'm aware that many of you are joining from many different parts of the world, and I'm really thrilled to have so many of you actually participating in the webinar this, uh, this afternoon here in London. And uh, presenting and debating uh, the findings and the lessons of a 15-month long project for me is indeed a great privilege. Uh, and I really would like to thank uh, my fellow panelists that are joining me from three different parts of the world. This is the kind of beauty of a webinar, I mean, from Gaboroni, Puebla, and Paris. Uh, because they've been involved in the project at very different kind of points in time. Uh, they provided very helpful comments, feedback, and uh, I'm really grateful they could make it uh, today for, for the webinar. So as David mentioned, uh, I've got 10 minutes, that's the time I've got, uh, but I really would like to give you a bit of a sense of the report, uh, the summary report that we launched on Monday the 9th, in particular to set the scene uh, for the debate that uh, the panelists and later with all of you joining online uh, will have. And I would like to focus on three different aspects of the research. First of all, why we have decided to work on this project, in particular the 
gaps, the policy gaps that we wanted to kind of address. Second, the research questions that enable us to address these policy gaps and also how we tackled those research questions. And as David mentioned, the very third point, which I think the most important one, is that what have we learned throughout this kind of 15-month-long project? And um, somehow, going back to the very first point, uh, the motivation uh, um, of this particular project, I mean, a few years ago, colleagues at the OECD estimated that uh, by 2030, so the deadline of the SDGs, uh, 30 countries uh, will have graduated from the list of all the eligible countries. I would like to kind of explain what uh, graduating from the list of all the eligible countries means and what it doesn't mean. So a country is no longer eligible for ODA when it's a high income economy for three years in a row. So, and more or less is around an annual income per capita of 12,000 US dollars. Which is, leads me to the second point, uh, what it doesn't mean. Of course, a country can still receive aid, but the resources that donors actually provide cannot be counted against, for example, the official development assistance to GNI target that many donors have. Therefore, especially for larger amounts, uh, providing assistance to countries that are no longer on that list uh, is a clear disincentive. So, 30 countries uh, expected to graduate from the list of all the eligible countries by 2030. Some of them have already done so. It's quite a, a large number of countries. And also there are many countries that are moving away from aid, uh, moving up the income per capita ledger and becoming less, less, less and less dependent um, on official development assistance. When we try to kind of uh, un try to understand uh, how these countries that are moving away from aid uh, can sustain and broaden the development, their development results, what type of assistance needs and support uh, they might receive from development partners to plan, implement, and finance projects and programs, and also how the relationships beyond uh, official development assistance can be shaped. Actually, we found very little evidence from the literature when we started. So we really wanted to kind of try and fill this kind of analytical gaps. And uh, in the next slide that you have in front of you, we try to kind of uh, summarize uh, the objectives uh, and the gaps uh, that we're trying to kind of uh, fill uh, with this kind of particular research project. And uh, I can structure the different kind of objectives and questions uh, into three different buckets. The first one is the perspective of the recipient country uh, when it comes to the management of the transition from aid. What are the strategies and approaches that countries have implemented? What how the relations with development partners have evolved. From the perspective of development partners, uh, how should the new forms of development cooperation be shaped, in particular in the transition away from aid in this kind of particular phase? Uh, and, in, and the other kind of point, important one, what type of needs, support, actually countries in transition are demanding development partners when it comes to the planning, the implementation, and the financing of development projects and programs? The third kind of set of questions actually looks at the future, at the cooperation beyond official development assistance. So when flows actually stop, uh, what are the expectations about future modalities of bilateral and multilateral engagement? What are the forums and opportunities uh, for policy dialogue beyond, beyond official development assistance? So to answer these questions, uh, we took a case study approach. And we looked into the uh, experiences of four different countries uh, at three different kind of uh, um, positions in the transition away from aid. We looked at the experiences of Botswana and Mexico. Uh, both of them are set to graduate from the list of all the eligible countries by 2030, um, and they're midway through this transition. Uh, we wanted to study these experiences. We'll hear later from Keith and Juan Pablo because this gives us a kind of uh, um, a point of view in the challenges and opportunities of countries that are midway through the transition and also starting planning what will come beyond ODA. 
we looked at the experience of a country that has already graduated from the list of all the eligible countries. This is the case of Chile, that graduated in January 2018. This gives an insight on um, about a country that completed the entire trajectory, but also we can see the early stages of the relations beyond official development assistance. And finally, we looked at the entire trajectory from being a recipient country to actually being one of the poorest countries uh, uh, after the Second World War to graduate from the list of all the eligible countries in 2000 and then become, become a, became a, um, actually a member of the Development Assistance Committee, so a donor reporting to the, um, to the uh, Development Assistance Committee of the OECD, and that's Korea. It gives us uh, the full kind of picture of the trajectory um, away from aid, but also a series of insights about how the relationship beyond ODA can be shaped. You might wonder how we address these questions. I mean, I'm not getting into the details. I've just only got only 10 minutes, and I spend all that time uh, talking about the methodology. But this is a political economy framework uh, on which this research is based, uh, which means that uh, the economic context, the political context, the social context, uh, they all shape uh, the volumes, uh, the trends, uh, the composition of external finance. And these points will come up also in the description of the lessons from the case studies. We spent actually a week in each capital over the past uh, year, and uh, we actually had the privilege uh, um, of speaking with many of you actually that are now joining online, uh, government officials in central and line agencies, development partners, uh, representatives of civil society organizations and academia. And this is for me also an opportunity to thank all of you for the time and insights, uh, and also for the comments that you, you provided uh, to our different versions of the reports, which is leading me to the kind of uh, most interesting part of the project. Uh, and I'm talking about the lessons that emerge across the four country case studies. Of course, I'm aware we cannot really generalize uh, findings and lessons of four country case studies across all developing countries, uh, where different stages of development and different points in time. But there are a series of kind of uh, lessons that are very much common across the four country case studies, and I'm going to point uh, them out. Uh, but also a few interesting kind of modalities and instruments uh, that were particularly kind of helpful uh, for those countries in the management of the transition away from aid. To simplify things on actually going through the lessons uh, and findings uh, based uh, on the kind of structure of the research questions, which is kind of leading me to what we learned when it comes to the management of the transition from aid. The very first point, national development plans matters, and that's the kind of key document and instrument uh, to sustain development outcomes. Uh, particularly in the case of the Republic of Korea, official development assistance was embedded uh, in the National Development Plan, very clear what it should have, which sectors that should have kind of supported, uh, and particularly strategic in the use of ODA when other development finance flows weren't available. In the case of Mexico, the role of aid is spelled out in uh, the National Development Plan. Uh, Chile, as well, at the initial stages of their transition from democracy, included uh, the role of ODA. But actually, because we have to be very clear, the contribution of ODA to the government budget is very low in all these countries, or at least when they were in the midst of the transition. And of course, it wasn't higher up on the radar of the Chilean government. But the Chilean government was caught by surprise when the graduation from official development assistance was announced, and we can debate that later on. Second point, we shouldn't forget about the NGOs. Uh, actually, non-governmental organizations uh, transition from external assistance earlier than governments. Uh, smaller volumes of development assistance tend to be channeled and tend to concentrate uh, uh, through by government channels uh, for different reasons that we can debate. And sometimes NGOs are actually left in the lurch. There was an expression used many times um, in the interviews, uh, uh, and not necessarily kind of other actors stepping up. We found a very, interest, very interesting use of uh, instruments, uh, again in the management of the transition away from aid as a kind of a tool, uh, learning tool. Uh, and these were particular kind of joint committees arrangements, trust funds. This was particularly the case 
of Mexico is not only about co-financing, uh, but it's also about planning together, implementing together, and kind of lessons sh lesson sharing. Uh, and also, there were very interesting kind of innovative financing mechanisms. I'm talking about the Chile Fund against uh, poverty and hunger um, that actually created additional resources. We shouldn't kind of forget that South-South cooperation is often kind of uh, uh, constrained from a budget perspective. Then we saw very clear in the in the case of uh, AMEXID, which is the Development Agency of Mexico, and AXID, uh, the Development Cooperation Ag Agency of Chile, the fact that within the same agency uh, there were responsibilities for incoming flows, so ODA received, but also assistance provided to other countries was, again, a good opportunity for learning with the other countries, learning opportunity with other countries, but also to build the capacity to become a donor or a provider of development assistance. And the final point I dare say kind of applies more to development partners. Um, they should really develop a strategy for managing the transition away from aid. Often plans are not in place. Communication uh, might be a surprise uh, to governments uh, um, about transition and exit, but also communication should be verified across the government. Uh, government is a big entity. One part of the government might know, the rest might not be aware. Which is leading me to the type of cooperation uh, uh, countries in transition expect from development partners. I think the key word here is about technical assistance. We can talk about in the Q&A about the specificity of it, uh, but essentially the main concern about uh, those countries in transition wasn't about uh, falling financial assistance, but it was mainly about uh, the fact that with falling financial assistance, also the technical assistance which is kind of attached to it would have kind of fallen. And that's the kind of need uh, just came up in many interviews, the need for peer learning, knowledge sharing. And to a certain extent, the demand for technical assistance is very sophisticated. We're not talking about the generic one, but particular technical assistance to address key vulnerabilities, sometimes so sophisticated that some donors weren't able to address it or might, kind of find, might have found it very challenging. And the key area for engagement uh, has always been mentioned around uh, the global uh, public good agenda, in particular climate change. Countries have also demanded uh, assistance to become providers of uh, development assistance themselves. So this is very clear in the case of uh, Mexico with Amexida, but also in the case of Korea, as well as in the case of Botswana, which is kind of setting up a South-South and triangular cooperation. This is within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. And countries also are demanding a diversified financing toolbox. It's not only about grants, it's not about loans, but it's about sophisticated technical assistance, but also um, instruments that are probably less common, but risk mitigation instruments and guarantees. Which is leading me to the very final point, uh, a set of kind of uh, findings around the cooperation beyond ODA. If I have to be entirely honest, uh, this has been the kind of most challenging part uh, of the research project. Uh, and for different reasons, may have been my background. Uh, I've been working a lot on, as David was kind of mentioning on, on the question of how we can make aid most effective and can be allocated to the poorest countries. Uh, but also because uh, the counterparts we often engage with, the ministers of foreign affairs, uh, uh, government officials, uh, might not have kind of thought about it as of yet. And primarily the kind of paradigm uh, is always about official development assistance and not what comes next. And that's kind of the reason why I pointed out the first recommendation is about uh, not necessarily kind of developing a fully fledged strategy, but it's about uh, developing uh, a plan about uh, how the relations will be kind of shaped beyond ODA. Of course, we know diplomatic relations are in place, economic relations are in place, but what will come next after the kind of projects and programs funded by ODA will cease? My second point leads me to an important kind of reflection. I mean, while bilateral donors might decide to leave, uh, also because assistance cannot be longer kind of uh, um, counted as ODA, multilateral development banks and multilateral organizations stay there. And that's a very important point. Uh, um, multilateral development banks have very different kind of graduation rules. Uh, they continue kind of lending uh, to upper middle income countries, not necessarily uh, ODA eligible because it might be slightly more expensive, but still better than market terms. 
And again, countries can access the technical assistance even by paying for it uh, from the multilateral system. Penultimate point, uh, countries kind of express the need for spaces uh, to continue policy dialogue, again, for peer learning and knowledge sharing. Um, this is kind of uh, thinking about uh, the case of uh, Chile, uh, Mexico, Korea. These are all three members of the OECD. Mexico and Korea also G20 members. Uh, they have kind of spaces and possibilities uh, to continue the dialogue with uh, former kind of uh, development partners, more at the technical level. Smaller countries like Botswana might not have that option. Which is leading me to the very final point, uh, the fact that actually there are other ways to kind of keep the policy dialogue open, uh, which is about kind of taking advantage of uh, regional programs that could indirectly benefit also countries that are no longer ODA eligible, uh, but also triangular cooperation programs. It's again building on a kind of expertise uh, of uh, countries that are moving away from aid for other countries that are going through the, uh, down that path. This is again. Uh, a very kind of uh, short uh, overview of the kind of findings and lessons uh, from the summary report that everyone can find online. Uh, there are detailed uh, uh, findings and recommendations based on individual, individual country case studies that I would encourage everyone to look at. Uh, I very much look forward to the reaction of my fellow panelists, uh, but also to the questions of the uh, online audience, and thank you very much. Thanks so much, Annalisa. That's really helpful uh, summary there of the research that we launched on Monday on moving away from aid uh, and some of the lessons being learned. I'm now going to turn um, straight away to uh, Keith Jeffries, who is the managing director of eConsult Botswana. Uh, Keith has a long standing and deep knowledge and expertise of economic development in Botswana uh, and was a former deputy governor of the Bank of Botswana, in fact. So he uh, he's brings an incredibly uh, valuable perspective. Uh, Keith, over to you. Okay, thanks very much and, and thanks for the, the, the summary and also for the opportunity. So I want to, uh, I'm not going to repeat what's in the, the Botswana case study because a lot of it is, the issues are very well presented, but I just want to summarize uh, what I think are some of the key um, uh, takeaways, some of the key learnings. I mean. Um, uh, in terms of the transition away from aid, um, I think uh, Botswana, uh, being a reasonably well-managed country in a macroeconomic sense, um, the financial, the withdrawal of, of uh, donor financing really w was not a big deal because although uh, Botswana was very reliant on, on financial flows early on in the period after independence, it became less and less important. And um, uh, because uh, you know Botswana had a long period of mineral-led growth, and actually saved a considerable proportion of the revenues from diamonds and built up financial resources, so that uh, um, when aid flows finally um, they haven't completely disappeared, but they they they're very they're relatively insignificant. Um, it was not really a financial shock because public finances were in, were in pretty good shape. Um, but I think the, the point I want to emphasise, uh, which Annalisa made, it's, it's much more about the technical assistance and the technical expertise. And um, I think that the absence of the, the technical support which came along with much ODA is much more keenly felt. Um, and, and that has left a gap. Um, and I would say that in some respects, actually, the quality of some governance has deteriorated in Botswana. It's still not bad, um, but I would say it's not as good as it was 20 years ago. Um, whether that's due to the withdrawal of ODA and, and some of the technical assistance that came along with it, I think maybe causality is difficult to prove, but certainly there's a correlation. Um, and I do think that uh, the need for technical assistance and, and expertise lasts much longer than the need for financial assistance. Um, and the two have to be seen somewhat uh, separately. Um, I think another point that the Botswana experience uh, emphasizes or illustrates is that um, you know issues are not constant. and. Um, uh, 
you know, the dynamic nature of development and development challenges means that new issues come up. And obviously the big one with, with Botswana was the whole HIV AIDS uh, epidemic uh, emerging a couple of decades ago, which posed some very big challenges in terms of public health care, public health system, and also financial challenges. And um, even though Botswana was in the process of graduating away from ODA when that challenge emerged, um, on a positive note, um, uh, the international community responded um, quite quickly and quite generously to help Botswana deal with that emerging challenge. Um, so I think the point there is that uh, um, it's not a smooth path and new challenges emerge, which may mean that even for um, upper middle income countries uh, and countries that are graduating away from aid, uh, if you like, emergencies can, can arise. And I think the, the point that's been made about uh, climate change and some of the challenges that that poses is, is another illustration. And, and if anything, it's, it's got more of a public good component. Um, but I think there's a lot of, uh, again, it's, it's partly a financial issue, but partly a, a technical expertise issue, like, um, you know, how do you access global climate funds um, where there slightly frozen for a moment there we're just gonna give Keith a moment uh, to see if we can we can re-establish the connection so just bear with us online for a moment please okay um, looks like we're having some problems reconnecting uh, with Keith so we'll We'll, we'll, we'll move on to, um, uh, to our next speaker, and, and if we can get Keith back, we'll, we'll go back to him. So uh, uh, apologies, Keith, to you. We're just going to move on for the moment, and then we will, we will, oh, back. we'll come back. Ah, sorry, Keith, are you, are you back with us? We can see you, but we can't hear you. Okay, okay, it was a... It was a, a bit of false hope there, but, uh, but we will come back to you once we've managed to sort out those technical issues. So uh, forgive us, uh, uh, our audience online. We're going to move on to um, our next speaker, Juan Pablo Prado Leande, who is uh, a professor at the Benemereta Universidad uh, Autónoma uh, de Puebla. Uh, Juan Pablo has written extensively on Mexican aid flows uh, and aid management, uh, and we're absolutely delighted that he was able to join us to be uh, our expert on this subject. Juan Pablo, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me thank ODI as well as Rachel. Callejan and Alisa Prison, uh, David Watson, of course, for this kind invitation to participate in this uh, webinar. Well, Go Beyond ODA is one of the main, main and most important issues either in international development cooperation policies as well as international relations academia. For Mexico, uh, the study is very useful because it explains different key issues about the past and current position of Mexico in development agenda. Explaining how, um, explaining how uh, this issue is moving on in Latin America country, uh, explaining how this Latin American country faces, I mean Mexico, both national and foreign challenges related with this international cooperation and as a provider and recipient. For me, uh, the, as researcher, as researcher and teacher, the research is interesting because it helped me to better understand not only ODA transition or graduation, but many other relevant issues, topics, criteria that shape international development cooperation worldwide. Uh, transition and graduation is a I think it's a unilateral procedure, actually. Decision from OCD DAC countries. So it is not the best example of international development partnership, dialogue, collaboration among providers and recipients. And precisely because of that, 
This topic is a key issue of developing agenda. For example, GNI criteria of developing countries as a relevant parameter to implement transition or graduation procedures does not consider the huge inequalities in the South and mainly in Latin America. Uh, so OECD ODA graduation schemes does not necessarily fit with many Latin American country context. I think that uh, using this parameter is the mm, implementation of the old fashioned modernization theory in the 21st century. Well, uh, does uh, the way how North and South countries face, manage, implement, or punish transition and graduation processes is one of the main and most interesting topics in international cooperation agenda. So that's why the richness of this, of both the uh, studies here. In this sense, the path or the way how recipients countries face this challenge is a very useful tool to understand its national and international development cooperation policies and the way how the South and North will together shape the international development cooperation system to foster 2030 agenda and its SDGs. So uh, after reading both reports, it is clear for me that the way how countries are facing the transition graduation processes depends first of its own governance, institutionalization, I mean, standards, its capacity building, but not only it's about that, of course. It is also about government perceptions about the topic, as well as the political will to face this phenomenon. Well, about the Mexican experience, let me say that I enjoyed a lot the reading of the report. I absolutely agree on the fact that Mexico is being moving towards ODA graduation, but without enough planning or a clear strategy to manage the process. This is due to different situations, such as, again, government perceptions, political will to face this uh, phenomena, and institutional capacity to face ODA graduation. All of this considering that international development cooperation man managed is managed through the Secretary of Foreign Affairs. And in this sense, development cooperation is mainly seen as a foreign policy instrument and not really a national development strategy. So this is a very important point about this. For countries like Mexico, international development cooperation is more a foreign policy instrument rather than a developing or development strategy. No? So this is one of my main points. Well, as we can read on the report, Mexico has a very interesting report as ODR recipient. At the beginning, my country did not receive an important amount of ODA, but since 2000, different bilateral and multilateral donors increased ODA with the aim to support Mexican government to face security uh, challenges as well as climate change policies. Well, this because the, and as Rachel said, the geostrategical importance of Mexico as well as the result of a very interesting improvement of international cooperation institutionalization, mainly through the creation of AMEXIT, our National Agency of Development Cooperation. Also, the alignment of Mexico to OECD aid effectiveness guidance is another reason that explains this situation, of course, among many others. Well, However, Amexid authorities have not put enough importance 
to, Mex to Mexican graduation process. I mean, although we have an improvement of national, international development in, uh, institutionalization, my country through Amexid have not put enough importance to Mexican graduation process. The question is why? Well, from my point of view, this is because the agency is overwhelmed, managing a huge amount of issues, pragmatic and programmed ones, as many other developing countries used to, to do or to face. No? There are not enough officials that are aware of this matter. I mean, of graduation. Programming is not the main characteristic of Mexican cooperation policy, as well as happens with many other developing countries, such as Mexico. That's why I, I, I agree with Rachel and Annalisa in the fact that, and I quote, there are capacity gaps in planning and implementation as persistent challenges. And this happens in many, many South countries. That's why I support that, and I quote, development partners should develop a strategy to manage, to better manage transition from aid. So Mexican international cooperation was normal or conventional, let me say, in, in, in my country, yes, but since this year, since this year, everything changed. Mexican President López Obrador is abruptly changing national politics, national public policies, such as foreign policy, and thus Mexican international development cooperation policies and activities, of course. On this new scenario, Mexico is shifting international development cooperation priorities. Currently, Mexican authorities are promoting the offer of economic and technical assistance to El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, rather than search, ask, or even accept, this is a very weird situation, ODA offers. So Mexico is not willing to continue receiving the same amounts of ODA that we received before from the traditional donors. One of the main implications of this is that Amexid is not currently actually thinking, not planning Mexican ODA graduation. We are looking to the South rather than looking to the North, waiting for uh, international assistance. The interesting and contradictory in this sense is that precisely under Obrador's rule, Mexico is going to receive less ODA from abroad. So the main effect of this is that it is very possible that Mexico will accelerate, accelerate its tr transition ODA process. So it's the main title and the main topic of the report. No? So this phenomenon is going to be improved since this year and I think during the next years. So Mex Mexico will actually face the transition Pablo, sorry of Sorry to interrupt you, but could you bring your remarks to a close, yes. please? Apologies. Sure. Just to end, so Mexico will actually face the transition of aid, but I'm afraid that it will be not managed it properly because of a lack of adequate perception of the importance of this issue the lack of political will to face this situation and a lack of enough Mexican international development cooperation institutionalization or governmental capacities. That's it for, for my part. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juan Pablo, particularly for those insights into uh, the domestic political situation in Mexico. Fascinating and I think um, really interesting. I'm sure that the uh, the online audience will want to delve into some of those a little bit later. Uh, but for the moment, let's move on to um, uh, Olivier Cataneo, who is the um, head of policy uh, analysis and strategy at the Development Cooperation Directorate at the OECD. So over the last two years, Olivier and his team have been analyzing the implications of 
transitioning from aid uh, for development uh, for financing for development uh, and uh, th they've considered a broad range of country experiences low income middle and high income countries uh, so I think he brings an incredibly uh, important uh, and insightful perspective to the debate today so Olivier over to you Thank you. Thank you, David and uh, Annalisa. And uh, sorry again for not being able to be physically in London today because of the strikes in France. Um, so um, I just wanted to congratulate, I mean, Annalisa and the team, I mean, for the great job they have done. Uh, as, uh, as David, you just mentioned, uh, our work has been, has had almost the same timing and uh, the same approach uh, with, uh, that is evidence-based and looking at case studies. Uh, we started with uh, seven case studies. Uh, one was Capo Verde, uh, Zambia, Uganda, Vietnam, Lebanon, uh, Solomon Islands, and uh, Chile. To reflect different stages of different uh, of, pro uh, of development and uh, different sets of uh, of problems. We, however, had a different uh, perspective from uh, from the start. Um, Analisa ODI was looking mainly at the graduation from ODA. Uh, issue. We were looking at transition at large, I and mean, starting from the poorest uh, to the richest of the country who benefit from uh, from aid. Uh, and we were looking at all the sources of financing. I mean, public, private, domestic, and foreign, and how they articulate uh, and change over time. So for us, I mean, one of the conclusion of, of this it was that uh, ODA graduation. Uh, is actually just one of many milestones I mean, on this uh, development um, uh, journey and uh, actually not necessarily the hardest one. Uh, we see that, uh, for instance, graduation from LDC category or even sometimes from low-income country category, I mean, using the example of, of Zambia, and you see that already some donors leave uh, at this very early stage of, uh, of development. The second difference is that we had, um, I mean, Annalisa mentioned the recipient country and the development partner uh, perspective. So we definitely took the DAC perspective, the Development Assistance Committee of the, of the OECD, and uh, we did our diagnostic for the DAC. Uh, and as you know, there are lots of diagnostics out there. I mean, one of them very close is UNDP, Development Finance uh, Assessment. And now the, the challenge is for all those people who do diagnostics is how to move from diagnostic to implementation and how to reconcile, I mean, all those views, recipient development partners into uh, the INFF, the Integrated National uh, Financial Frameworks, and uh, align perfectly with the country strategy. Now, just back to the, to the conclusions, I think we had the exact same conclusions as the ODI team. Uh, so I won't repeat all the ones that uh, Annalisa mentioned, but um, and they will all be presented to the DAC in Paris in, in January and discuss uh, to decide on the way forward, be it principles, recommendations, and how to handle better uh, transition. Uh, but the main one is that uh, we confirm there is a lack of preparedness and a poorly managed uh, transition process. Uh, or not even managed at all in most uh, in most cases, and uh, our conclusion is that it's a lose lose um, for the recipient countries and for the development partners. For for the recipient countries, I mean there is uh, obviously the risk of a financial cliff uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, with shortage of uh, some resources. This is not for all the countries, not for all the sectors. Uh, not all are equal. Uh, for instance, we, we see with the small island developing states, I mean, lots of difficulties to mobilize the private sector and lots of fragility linked to the climate change and so on. Or we see in some sectors like energy where there is a perfect substitution of public and concessional and non-concessional uh, finance, but a huge gap in social sectors that when the donors go, there isn't as much uh, other resources uh, available. Um, then, so that the lose from the recipient country's perspective, but also from the DAC perspective, because of the poor resilience of the ODA efforts and, uh, and the risk of setbacks uh, if uh, the domestic resources are not mobilized 
Uh, one example I, I just gave you was with Zambia graduating from low-income country, uh, no way leaving, no way being in charge of financing or giving technical assistance to the Zambia Revenue Authority, which is supposed to take over after, uh, after aid has been phasing out, but then suddenly no resources, no technical capacity building for, for this, uh, for this uh, Zambia Revenue Authority. Uh, another example is for Vietnam, where we were recently, uh, and the, Vietnam is at the transition stage moving from public funding of the donors to private uh, funding. Um, so because it's reaching this stage uh, where it's attractive enough for the private sector. But then the question is whether the private sector will preserve the sustainability and the inclusiveness of growth or whether that will be lost. And the, the, the donors should anticipate and uh, build an environment, a business environment that will be conducive to a certain behavior of business or all their efforts will be lost. Uh, a last point I would like to, 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 to make uh, in the 30 seconds I've left is that um, we only monitor official development assistance and what the DAC uh, OECD countries are doing. Um, but we also must be aware that there are other actors out there, uh, the main one being China, and we see many of the pilots in Africa in particular, uh, this is a critical issue. And then the question is one of the quality of the financing also that I mentioned with the private sector, but also with other actors uh, that uh, we, we have less information about the, trans, uh, about the quantity, I mean, of the, the flows that arrive. So there's a question of transparency. There is a question of debt sustainability and, and so on. So that's just the point that I wanted to mention. So we monitor always what the DAC is doing, but uh, the DAC is not alone out there anymore. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Olivier, for, for those insights and telling us uh, a little bit about the, the work that uh, the OECD uh, Development Corporation Director is also doing uh, for the DAC. And great to hear that that will be going to, uh, to the DAC to inform their considerations on these subjects. And, and also uh, really good to hear that, 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 that similar lessons are emerging from both um, uh, the work that, that Annalisa and her team have done and, and that you and your colleagues have done as well. So um, uh, there, although, although I think we, we all, we all kind of, we, we all caveat that we can't, we can't categorically learn, um, you know, we, we, we can't, we can't prescribe as a result of, of, of some of these selective case studies, but, but there are clearly some parallels being drawn between the, the two pieces of, of research, which I think is really helpful and, and, and hopefully will be useful to uh, policymakers and leaders in the DAC when they're thinking about uh, what they do next. Okay, so uh, we've heard from our, um, uh, uh, our three uh, uh, visiting uh, experts and panelists and obviously uh, my colleague Annalisa here, here at ODI. Uh, Keith, I think, is now on the line uh, again, uh, although I don't think we can, we can see him, unfortunately. But uh, Keith, um, if there was, uh, we, we're running slightly over time. But if there, if you had, if there was anything in sort of thirty seconds you wanted to add to uh, what you were saying before, otherwise we can. We're obviously you're, we're going to have a chance to bring out some more of the issues as we get into the discussion. Uh, but but if there was anything you wanted yeah. to, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm not quite sure where where I got um, where where you lost me. But, uh, but I, the the one point I was in the middle of making was that the situation for civil society and NGOs uh, is quite different to the situation for government. So whereas Botswana government uh, maybe didn't miss the, uh, the, certainly not the financial side of, of the, the running down of ODA, uh, civil society and NGOs definitely did. So they've been left hanging a bit and maybe donors need to bear that distinction in mind. And the second is, is just sort of turning more towards previous ODA recipients as as providers of, of ODA, I mean, the, the case study on Botswana does note that Botswana has been providing some assistance to neighboring countries. But again, on the technical assistance point, I think, um, you know, given that the countries that graduate from ODA and have many 
aspects of being well run, I think there's a lot of learning they can share with other poorer countries. Um, and uh, certainly I think you know, Botswana's experience in managing mineral wealth is something that's quite widely sought after um, in other emerging mineral economies. And, and that's something to think about is whether there's a channel for these graduating countries to provide maybe not necessarily finance, but technical assistance and advice to other um, countries still receiving aid. Great. Thank you. Thanks for adding those, uh, Keith. Very helpful. Uh, on top of a, a really interesting um, uh, set of points that you made around the situation for the Botswana economy, uh, the crucial role of technical assistance, um, and how these kind of ev the events and emer I mean events everywhere, of course, coming in to 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 uh, upset best laid plans, but but particularly the HIV AIDS. Uh, crisis and other emergencies in 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 Botswana and the and the the increasingly um, uh, or the already but uh, ever increasing uh, threats posed by by climate change. So thanks very much to all of our speakers. Uh, I'd like to um, open the discussion now to uh, questions and and contributions from our online audience. So you can ask your uh, we've got some questions already, but if you if you've been mulling, you've been listening intently to our our, our experts uh, and 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 are now kind of um, bringing some questions to mind. Please do uh, submit them through the through the online window. Um, so we've got a couple of questions that have come in already. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm try and group them together as best as best possible and and, and maybe take. Uh, either either a question that's representative of of some of the questions that are coming in, or, or group them together uh, in in twos or threes. So if I don't if I'm not asking your exact question, it, 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 please don't be uh, disheartened. It's because we've we, we've tried to group them together. So uh, one thing actually, and this this so the the first one I'm going to zero in on, uh, and this is a point actually Juan Pablo made uh, uh, around how. How interesting! The, I mean, as, as Juan Pablo put it, I think the, the there was an inequality to a degree in uh, sorry the, 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 there was a unilateralism in the procedure that the OECD DAC applies to graduating countries, uh, which wasn't necessarily uh, the best example of the idea of a dialogue between uh, northern and southern countries. So, so one of our, uh, well, a couple of our um, uh, uh, members of the online uh, community have zeroed in on that, uh, and they've just asked straight out, is there a case to reopen the criteria for ODA graduation? Uh, and if so, what, what would the options and, and proposals uh, be around that? Um, there are a couple of other things uh, around ODA. Uh, so uh, maybe maybe let's 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 start with ODA and then and then we can move on uh, to, to to some of the other ones. So so let's go with that question first. Maybe um, Keith, as you were so sort of uh, uh, unceremoniously cut in half during your your intervention, do you want to go first on the question about ODA graduation? Yeah. Um, look, I think the, the 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 financial criteria of um, the, the twelve thousand dollar mark, which is roughly equivalent to high income status, probably makes sense. Um, you know, I, you know, one has to bear in mind that, of course, the provision of ODA um, has to is has to be uh, viewed as um, acceptable by the public in, in the, the donor countries. And I think that if we see uh, financial flows going to high-income countries, that make, might make it more difficult to maintain that, that public support. But um, again, going back to the distinction between financial flows on a large scale and maybe smaller uh, lower level financial flows devoted to the financing of technical assistance, um, maybe that type of, of odor could be sustained uh, even if countries are, are at higher income levels. But I think that um, large-scale financial flows to high-income countries becomes a bit more difficult to, to 
defend in the court of public opinion. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Annalisa, do you agree? Well, I mean, to a certain extent, the, um, the criteria for um, older graduation is the only one solely based on income per capita. Uh, of course, this is a kind of an ex post assessment. I mean, as I said in, in initial remarks, it doesn't mean that donors cannot provide aid. I mean, if there is an emergency, even for high income economies, donors do come back. Uh, but without the incentive of contributing to the ODI G or the GNI target, uh, large amounts are certainly not won't be kind of provided by uh, by development partners. But if I can bring somehow the uh, what we learned during the kind of interviews with many government officials, and I believe some of you might be actually online. Uh, we often heard that uh, perhaps only one part of the country has, uh, is, has been graduated. That was particularly the case of our experience in Chile. So what we were told, I mean, uh, only Santiago graduated and not the rest of the country because of the kind of income uh, um, inequality. So there's, there is potentially a kind of a scope to kind of reopen it. Then the kind of key question is that around which other indicators uh, can be included. I mean, as I said, uh, the graduation from the list of all the eligible countries is the only one solely based on income, uh, but others are based on kind of, uh, of the lending offered by the institutions. If I think about the case of the World Bank, uh, the African Development Bank, uh, they base their kind of different steps, not only on income per capita, but also on a measurement of the access uh, uh, to capital markets, or in the case of the vertical funds, to um, the level of the disease burden. So there's a combination with other indicators, which becomes far more complex in the case of the graduation of official development assistance. Mm, yeah, so there's a simplicity versus uh, comprehensiveness, uh, or even comprehension versus comprehensiveness uh, issue there as well. Um, Olivier, we, we will come to you on this, but, uh, but I, I'm going to go to Juan Pablo first. Uh, uh, Presumably, you might you might you might you might agree with this this questioner. Yes, uh, I think that the financial income criteria is just one among many other factors to take it in account. For example, capacity building, good governance, rule of law. There are all these kind of issues that must be taken into account on the frame of of this of this matter. And I think I look up to this situation more than like an opportunity to make, on the, for example, the frame of, of, of that a political dialogue in order to face this situation and to manage it correctly. I mean, in a more properly way, in order that these criteria fit better to the circumstances of developing countries. I mean... Don't forget that political dialogue is another international development cooperation modality. So I think that this uh, issue is more like an opportunity to improve, to foster political dialogue in order to create a new frame on how South and North will manage this, uh, this uh, phenomenon. No? Okay, thank you. Uh, no, that's that's really, really helpful. And and Olivier, um, uh, what do you think? Is this on Susanna Moorhead's uh, agenda for the for the next uh, OECD DAP meeting? Oh, I, I don't think the the DAC is discussing. I mean, the, the the criteria. I mean, of the of the graduation. And again, I mean, our focus is on all the stages of of transition. I mean, not excluding any any of them but the the the, the conclusion from from our pilot uh, again is that uh, what what the countries are missing uh, when the donors leave uh, at certain state at their, i mean at a certain level of income it's not so much the financial resources uh, but uh, really the technical capacity in a country like um, like chile uh, when the the KFW was uh, still present, I mean, at the time of, uh, of graduation for some, I mean, uh, uh, renewable energies uh, projects, uh, they were sometimes even more expensive than the market. And so if they were going to, the, to Germany, uh, it was to benefit from uh, the, the, the technical assistance and this soft dimension uh, of, uh, of the loans. 
And uh, so I hopefully it's not because it's not monitored anymore uh, in terms of ODA flows after graduation that those relationships, I mean, will, will, will stop. Um, sometimes we even see that, uh, that the exchanges between the countries, uh, I mean, increase after graduation. Uh, so that, so that's something that, uh, again, one problem here is the definition of the term technical assistance everybody uses, and uh, we don't really have a definition. And uh, so that, that's one, one first point. The second one we see, I mean, as was mentioned, that uh, the donors also, I mean, uh, return or um, contribute, I mean, to some uh, global public goods one way or, or another, um, we see the case that we had one of our case stories was uh, Lebanon, I mean, that had become a high income country and then uh, the donors had to go back because of the war. And uh, so that, that's, an, that's another, uh, the, those countries or, or even some OECD countries that need uh, the support of others. Um, so and one point I, I noticed, however, in, in Lebanon is the question of of when international solidarity should stop and the government should be put uh, in front of the need to increase uh, national solidarity. Um, like in the case, I mean, with the, with the, with the refugees and uh, the, the, the social safety nets where they were uh, clearly, I mean, expecting uh, from the donors to, to step in. And it's very important when the donors uh, return that we build the capacity in the countries uh, so that the country can continue and prolong, I mean, the solidarity uh, with uh, with its own means. And so, yeah, so that, thank you. Okay, no, thanks, Olivier, and and and, and good good point, particularly there around um, uh, around what actually all of our uh, speakers today have said about the importance of technical assistance. Uh, uh, alongside and in addition to uh, to, to finance, um, but that actually we don't have we don't have that definition, uh, and uh, and and we need uh, we there, there potentially needs to be work done there. Um, so to, I, got, I want to try and try and get as many different sort of topic areas into the discussion uh, as possible. So uh, just turning to to some of the other issues that. Uh, people watching online have been raising. Uh, so we've got one around uh, what do countries in transition expect from their development partners with regard to the future extent and modalities of bilateral and multilateral cooperation. So what are the uh, what are countries themselves uh, looking for? Uh, and then uh, one uh, particularly, uh, so I guess particularly questions for uh, maybe that Keith and, and Juan Pablo may want to think about uh, in regards to Botswana and Mexico. When do you think that transition from aid started in those uh, in those countries, and, and what was the main trigger? Uh, what were the main uh, and what were the main consequences of donors leaving the country, if any? Um, so I don't think that Botswana and Mexico have actually graduated yet. So, um, but but I think that I'm sure there are there are um, uh, there are reflections that that, that Keith and, and Juan Pablo would make uh, 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 in terms of the progress that those countries are making so far. And then, uh, colleague uh, Joel from Impact for Health has asked uh, ch in terms of challenges faced by development partners. Were there any inputs from development partners on the challenges they had during this transition? So maybe that's that's a question for what maybe Annalisa uh, and maybe Olivier you want to talk to uh, what so what the ODI research and what the OECD research found in terms of the the conversations that that you were having with with development partners. So let's go with those three. Uh, so the first one, I guess everyone can have a crack at, then maybe the second one, uh, Juan Pablo and, and, and Keith, and maybe uh, Olivier and, and Annalisa for the third one. Uh, so, so maybe uh, Juan Pablo, if I come to you first this time, if that's okay. Sure, thank you very much. I mean, I think that uh, that should review the graduation criteria and uh, this is an, as I said, this is an opportunity to review and renew international development cooperation. Uh, 
And I absolutely agree with the report in the sense that there are many ways to face this, this uh, challenge. I mean, to renew international Develop development cooperation. For example, we have triangular cooperation. We have the chance to include NGOs and the private sector. J joint funds are a really very interesting way to improve, to foster horizontal cooperation among South countries and North uh, uh, and with uh, develop, develop, uh, developed countries, because this, this kind of cooperation improves flexibility and again, a sense of equality between partners. So joint funds is one of the many ways to improve this new international development cooperation that goes forward this, again, like unilateral criteria, criteria of uh, practice or not uh, operation. So uh, in this sense, I think that, uh, for example, in Mexico, as you know, Mexico is not really very interested to continue its active participation in DAC or even though OECD, because of the national governmental perception about foreign affairs are not really very uh, useful for, for, for my country. So I think that this situation will trigger the Besuang that my country, instead of not receiving ODA, could improve political dialogue with partners in order to reconstruct the way that Mexico is uh, receiving and providing cooperation. I think that this is more like an opportunity to face this uh, situation rather than a, 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 a mistake. So just to finish, I think that, for example, in Latin America and in Mexico as well, this is a huge opportunity to, again, on the frame of political dialogue, we have to move on and review and renew international development cooperation criteria and schemes because the South is changing. So I think that the North, OECD, and that should shift its policies, its point of view, in order to fit better to this uh, changing South uh, way of practicing international cooperation. It's a big challenge, but I think that political dialogue is the best way to improve a new international development cooperation scheme. Okay. Uh, Keith, anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, can I uh, comment on the, the issue of um, the tra when did the transition start and what the countries expect? Please, yes. Um, and, and I think that you know, in terms of the transition away from aid, um, it, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a binary situation. Um, so it's not like you get to $12,000 and, and your eligibility disappears overnight. It, it's a much more gradual process. Um, but I think, uh, so in Botswana's case, the transition... Although Botswana is still older eligible, actually the transition started 20 years ago um, with the, the winding down, um, particularly of support from Scandinavian countries, um, which was really withdrawn in, in, or certainly extensive support was withdrawn in the early 1990s. Um, I think that countries do need good warning um, uh, because you know, countries can become quite dependent on odor, um, and um, they they need to be able to adjust uh, to the uh, gradual um, decline in the amount of assistance they receive, um, so that it isn't too much of a shock. Um, and obviously, the, the 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 assistance should not be withdrawn 
um, too too suddenly. Um, but I think the, the in terms of what countries can expect, or, or yeah, what 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 would they expect in future, or as the shape of ODA changes? Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, assistance in responding to emerging challenges. Um, the, the HIV AIDS and climate change as I mentioned earlier um, another thing that's coming up I think as being important is um, assistance with regard to trade issues um, so I know in, in Botswana's case uh, the government has been keen on getting support to um, uh, to be a, a more successful well, would be, be better able to uh, benefit from trade agreements uh, such as the, the, the EPAs with the EU. Um, <clears throat> so assistance in accessing uh, export markets is, is quite critical. And then support for uh, participating in, in South-South and uh, triangular initiatives, I think, is also an area where uh, as countries graduate from... Um, uh, pure financial support is another area where uh, assistance would come in very useful. Okay, um, uh, Olivier, um, on the, I mean, you can by all means comment on the others uh, as well, but particularly I think it'd be useful to hear from you and Annalisa on on what you learned from development partners about some of the challenges they were facing. Yes, um, no, I, I think. Uh, as I, I mentioned earlier, I mean, the donors, I mean, our development partners are unprepared, I mean, for, for transition, and this probably needs to change, and that's why we'll put some recommendations forward, I mean, to to, uh, to the DAC, and maybe think of principles, I mean, uh, on how to better handle the, 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 the transition. Um, in particular, for instance, uh, it's, we need uh, a mapping of the role of the different actors, uh, of the different bank members. Uh, you have uh, development agencies and you have development banks, and they play very different roles at very different stages of development. And we need to better map, I mean, those, uh, those roles and instruments so that as the transition goes uh, more smoothly. We might also need to develop some dedicated uh, instruments um, like uh, transition grants or transition loans uh, that uh, in order to build the resilience of ODA and to avoid the financing gaps and uh, the, uh, the socioeconomic setbacks and build really the local capacity. That's what we have heard a lot uh, today. Um, other ideas, I mean, another one is like to create uh, a graduates club, for instance, for countries uh, that are recently graduated or for those who are about to graduate and how they could uh, exchange experience and solutions and discuss with the DAC uh, in preparation of uh, the graduation. Um, I liked also the, the, the word that was just uh, just uh, mentioned, that, uh, or the word of, uh, of warning, and I think uh, Chile is a good uh, illustration of uh, where you have lots of growth, you reach a certain uh, level of, uh, of, of income, but you still have inequalities, I mean, that are reducing, but uh, that are still there, in particular regional, as, uh, as Annalisa mentioned. And in that case, I mean, then it's a question of portfolio management for uh, the development partners. Uh, do you want uh, to completely give up, I mean, the social sectors and do loans uh, on infrastructure, or you also need to continue uh, thinking of governance and um, and social uh, sectors all the way up to the graduation. Um, the, the, to conclude, just to say that the financing for sustainable de development uh, landscape is increasingly complex with lots of factors, lots of instruments, uh, thousands of instruments to choose from for countries, and that can be extremely uh, difficult. And we probably need also to develop a form of technical assistance to to help uh, developing countries um, navigate this landscape. I mean, choose the best partners, the best instruments, negotiate the best conditions, and this doesn't exist yet. So there is lots uh, as you can see uh, to to be done in the in the near future to improve. Absolutely. So 
I'll, I'll elaborate on, on the question that was raised in terms of the kind of challenges for development partners on the ground during transition. Let me just start by probably an opportunity. I mean, uh, all the countries we work with, but also others, I mean, we, we've been working at ODI on the issue of transition for the past three years. We have another kind of series of reports for those online who might be uh, might be interested in is a series of reports called Exit from Aid, uh, uh, both from the country and the donor perspective. Uh, but one key element that came up in this last kind of series of case studies was also actually a positive note. I mean, all the countries, I mean, of course, Korea moved away from aid a long time ago, but all the countries have one element in common. They have relatively strong institutions uh, and the strong governance systems, uh, and therefore investing in those countries also delivers results. So there was also an encouragement uh, to, um, to provide assistance and kind of achieve and get results from the resources invested. And that's a kind of an important point that we shouldn't kind of forget. But there were inevitably some challenges for, for the development partners. I mean, uh, the first one is simply the kind of falling uh, uh, budgets. I mean, we, we never had the kind of chance to elaborate on the case of Mexico. Mexico is probably the outlier because of uh, geostrategic importance, not metro is a kind of a upper middle income mm -hmm. country, particularly Juan Pablo mentioned earlier around the security agenda, the climate change. But in all the other countries, it also means falling. Uh, budgets for development partners to manage. And that's inevitably a kind of uh, um, a key challenge to think about the future as well as the kind of scale and ambitiousness um, about that. And to a certain extent at times even the predictability uh, of projects. Uh, when it comes to negotiating uh, the new programs in country in transition, of course, there's always we need ownership and policy dialogue uh, when we can when development partners and uh, and partner countries governments decide on what to work on together but it becomes more sophisticated in the case of uh, an upper middle income country of course i'm i'm extremely kind of generalizing here but as i mentioned earlier on the the request can be extremely sophisticated that some of the multilateral bilateral donors might not necessarily need, know the answer to. It might go back to probably a consulting firm at times. And also one of the key challenges uh, we uh, we heard uh, from, from some of the development partners is also, is also kind of related to the number of actors uh, from the donor side. Because when it comes to the ODA paradigm, uh, it's often uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I'm talking about from the donor side, or the development agency, probably in the case of the UK, we're talking about DFID. Mm -hmm. But as somehow the kind of agenda expands uh, towards uh, business development, uh, climate, there are many more government departments uh, that are involved in in kind of aid programs. Uh, of course, this brings as ever kind of opportunities, but also challenges when it comes to the coordination of efforts, uh, budget appropriation, uh, but also the application of uh, development effectiveness principles uh, across all the development agencies that might not necessarily apply to foreign affairs ministries on the kind of non poverty reduction uh, programs on the climate change agenda. So, while there are challenges for the for the partner country uh, countries themselves, there are also challenges for development partners managing the programs in a transition away from aid. As, as, as indeed Juan Pablo was saying uh, around Amexid and the and the and some of the motivation, or at least the observed motivations behind, you know, where they are spending their money and and and, and, and what they are prioritizing. Okay, so. Um, we're 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 kind of coming towards the end of our of our time. I just want to put a, a few more of the questions out there um, and ask our 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 panel whether or not they 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 want to to respond. So so one of them was around um, the what is the role of multilateral development banks uh, in the transition uh, from aid, and whether there are any lessons uh, to be drawn there. I know Annalisa has done a, a lot of work around. The, the multilateral development banks, but, but other other colleagues might want to, to comment on that as well. Uh, and then a question from Deepak, would you say that a bilateral aid exit should also have an action line to help partner countries cope with the aid exit more generally? Uh, he Asking whether there might be a trade-off uh, in available resources there. Um, uh, and also around whether there was priorities uh, around sequencing in terms of of, of, of lessons learned more broadly. 
Um, uh, and then uh, also, I think we had a question around um, uh, so, sort of how countries in transition have have been able to manage their their sustainable development independently from from development assistance. So so what are some of the so what are the some of the crucial things there that that enable um, that kind of liberation uh, in, in a sense from from uh, from odor and to be able to sort of uh, to, to be able to uh, kind of move ahead uh, under their own uh, their own steam. So a couple of questions there. If I could ask our panel to be relatively brief in their responses, please don't don't feel the need to answer all of those questions. Just if you have anything uh, particular to say on any of those issues, uh, uh, and then I'm going to come back to you after that, just for a for a minute of uh, a minute each of of kind of revelations from today's discussion uh, or, or or kind of um, key things that, that you will take away but, but but firstly just on those on those questions around um, uh, bilateral aid uh, exit should there be an action line in there to help partner countries cope um, uh, and the and the and the question around uh, uh, independence from aid so Olivier has been very patient throughout the, the, the discussion, so maybe, Olivier, I will come to you uh, first this time. Any reflections on any of those? Okay. Yes, I mean, just on the, on the independence from aid, I mean, and, uh, uh, I think, I mean, one thing is, uh, I see three, three big changes, I mean, that need to be done. One is on resources and identifying new sources of financing, and we know that in some countries where informality is important, domestic resource mobilization, for instance, taxes is, is not easy. So um, same with, uh, with the private sector uh, development. And uh, uh, so, so that's one, one aspect. Um, and, and again, here, the quality of the, of the funding is, is quite important. And to give you the example of, uh, of Vietnam, that is in this process of... Uh, of finding its independence from aid and has frozen all the loans. I mean, for the past uh, couple of years, to 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 look for for private and domestic uh, sources, uh, they graduated <clears throat> from the global fund. I mean, for TB and um, and and malaria, and then uh, there was in their domestic resource mobilization, and there are all the resources uh, that are available. I mean, to substitute for uh, for the global fund's money. Uh, but then the government uh, decided not to invest in research uh, and to produce more locally. And then we see that progressively, even if the amount is the same, I mean, there is less innovation and there are no new uh, vaccination, I mean, and that are, that are introduced. So that's, again, something that is very important, not only to look just at the numbers, uh, but also look at uh, at the at the quality. I mean, the, beyond the resource, there is the institutions, and that was mentioned. I mean, how you move from a dialogue with the foreign affairs to technical ministries who also need to engage with their peers uh, abroad, uh, and sometimes also there is an ideological change. I mean, to 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 be uh, processed. I mean, like um, like in the example of uh, of Lebanon that I mentioned, or. Uh, or even of, of Vietnam with this, uh, with this example. Okay, thank you. Uh, and sorry, just, just quick reflections if, if, if the panel would be, would be so gracious, just because we're, 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 running, we're running out of time. Uh, Keith, can I come to you next, please? Yeah, I mean, I think just a comment on the sort of the exit process. Um, I think one thing that, that that's critical is for the different uh, donors to coordinate their exit. Um, you know, if everybody disappears at the same time, then that, that's clearly more of a problem. So, so a coordinated exit, um, I think, makes a lot of sense. And also, in terms of the sequencing, uh, the donor should be aware of the vulnerability or different vulnerabilities across different sectors, whether we're looking at health or education. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Annalisa. Um, Many points. Uh, um, in the case of the role of multilateral development banks, uh, I would really kind of like to reiterate uh, that they're going to stay even when bilateral donors uh, are leaving. Uh, and there are in certain cases, like the Inter-American Development Bank uh, doesn't have uh, a graduation policy. 
because it's a part, of, again, of a kind of uh, cooperative across member states. Uh, and, uh, of course, some of the countries might be able to borrow better terms in the market, but it's, again, the kind of... Uh, the technical expertise and the knowledge Im embedded into that. And sometimes they pay for it. I mean, it's not necessarily subsidized by the multilateral development bank. I will just kind of uh, address, it might require another webinar. We might think about a separate kind of series, uh, which is, again, uh, the trade-off between uh, shall we give to the poorest countries or how can we allocate uh, finite kind of resources to uh, upper middle income countries. Uh, um, first of all, we should kind of recall uh, when we're talking about technical assistance and programs, uh, the volumes of assistance, uh, of assistance are far lower than what, in relative terms, poorer countries. And again, I'm, loose, I'm using very loose terms here without kind of example. So we're talking about far smaller volumes. Uh, and I think and if I were to kind of leave also this meeting, I think we need uh, a stronger narrative uh, to justify the assistance for upper middle income countries. Uh, um, is it a kind of a global public good uh, side? Uh, it's part because we are investing uh, for the welfare of uh, everyone, that just for a single kind of country. And I think uh, it's easier in certain countries to have this narrative, might be more challenging in other donor countries. Uh, but I think once we have this kind of narrative clear, and I hope the kind of, as well, the reports that we produce contribute to that, I think that the kind of uh, addressing the trade-off that was kind of mentioned in one of the, of the questions could, can be addressed. Mm, thank you. Uh, Juan Pablo. Yes, uh, I think that the main factor that is triggering this uh, ODA graduation is or comes not actually from abroad, this is interesting, but from some South countries. I mean, this, all, this is about nationalism, that for example, in Brazil and Mexico, these countries are not willing to receive international cooperation as they used to before. And I think that this is a very, very big challenge that has to be taken into account. And again, just to finish, I think that in this sense, we have to improve incentives that these huge South countries uh, find that in practicing international cooperation is good enough, but in a new frame of political dialogue, just to try to improve new ways to practice international cooperation because nationalism that implies a less active foreign policy and thus uh, reduces the chances to practice international cooperation is, is, is uh, dangerous. So I think again that if North and South improves new ways to practice international cooperation through political dialogue, I think it's the best way to again, to um, improve that South countries and huge South countries close their borders to international cooperation, and again, try to foster a new deal in order to, to face these kind of challenges. Thank you. So, um, and, and, and thank you, thank you everybody for your for your questions and, and your participation today. Um, I'm just going to uh, give each of our experts literally 30 seconds each uh, to just share their conclusion uh, from today's discussion. So, please. Please, colleagues, this isn't a think tank conclusion. This is you. You've got two floors in a in a in an elevator, a lift with a minister. Uh, so you've got thirty seconds. What what are you going to say to the minister uh, about uh, what you what this minister needs to pay attention to in terms of moving away from aid? So very very brief, please. Um, I'm going to come to Keith first, if that's okay, uh, and then we'll we'll go we'll go to the others. So so Keith. You're first up on floor one to floor three. The, the, the elevator doors have closed. You've got your minister for 30 yeah, seconds. Look, I think say? the main message for the, for the minister is, you know, this is coming. Uh, don't pretend it's not going to happen. And uh, be, prepared, be prepared and be organized for it and, and decide what your prioritization is in, in terms of maintaining the, the reduced or reducing amount of ODA that's available. So be prepared and prioritise. That's good. Your minister goes off with clear instructions for for, for her next meeting. Um, Juan Pablo. Well, uh, just went that 
I concede. I think that Mexican government has to be aware, be prepared on this uh, phenomena. And in this sense, I think that countries like Mexico should improve its national and institutional frameworks in order to, under a political dialogue, face this uh, ODA uh, graduation in order to uh, create and uh, implement new ways to continue practicing international development cooperation without ODA. So the importance of frameworks for political dialogue, which very much links to, I think, the point you've been trying to drive home throughout this uh, webinar, uh, Juan Pablo, about the importance of moving to a, a political dialogue and, 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 a, and, a, and a new uh, environment for, for partnership. So thank you for that. Your minister goes off very clear uh, about what they need to do next. Olivier. So I will not talk to my minister, but to my DAC members and just tell them, I mean, to be Susanna prepared is, also. Susanna is best. there. She's about to go into the meeting, Olivier. She's your, she's your target. <laughs> so to just to say to be pre oh dear have we uh we've we've lost olivier at the crucial point <laughs> susanna's wandering into her meeting without a briefing uh not knowing what to say uh, but but fortunately olivier's team have done tremendous work uh, over the course uh, of their research so so she's been well briefed in the past so she's not without any uh, any advice um, uh, maybe let's come to Annalisa and see if we can get Olivier back uh, in the next minute or so well I don't have probably a counterpart uh, so but can I just make three um, very five Quick points. No, uh, no, 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 it's definitely one. Definitely one. <laughs> so sorry. my kind of, I wanted to kind of uh, go back to the kind of what I learned from uh, from this one, but. I reiterate certainly the kind of be prepared uh, and plan ahead. Uh, and this kind of applies both for the development partners, but also for the recipient countries. Uh, no way to kind of uh, avoid that, especially those are the kind of, uh, those countries that are very close to the ODA graduation. Uh, and we, we need to kind of think about uh, how the relationship will be shaping up um, after the ODA programs uh, um, are shut down. And, and, and very much chiming, of course, with what, what, the, what the other experts have have, have said today. Do, do, do we? Uh, don't know whether we've got Olivier back just to give him a, just to give him a, a, a few seconds at the end. That's a so that's a shame. So, and sorry to sorry to our online audience and and particularly to Olivier to to have cut him off at the end there. An incredibly rich discussion. Um, a huge thanks to our to our experts. Um, to Annalisa here with me at ODI. Um, Thank you. You oh no! So it's been it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, it's always a, a, a it's always fascinating to to return to this really important area and talk about financing for development. Thanks to Juan Pablo uh, for joining us from Mexico. Thanks to Keith uh, for joining us from Botswana and to Olivier um, uh, uh, who is in Paris. I hope uh, uh, not. Uh, uh, I hope I hope doing okay and, and, and uh, just had a had a had an issue with his has an issue with his phone. So thanks thanks very much to our panel for taking part. Thanks to the online audience. Thanks for su submitting so many interesting questions. You can continue this discussion between yourselves on social media using the hashtag away from aid uh, and, and looking through and, and, and continuing uh, to engage with the, the comments and the, and the questions going to at ODI Dev and, and some, of our, some of our panelists and experts who've taken past, part today. Uh, this webinar will be available online at the ODI website afterwards uh, in the next day or so. Uh, you can find it at odi.org. Uh, and please keep following us online and following us on Twitter to find out more about our events and discussions. Uh, and do follow our experts uh, on their social media hashtags uh, and handles as well uh, to continue talking with them about the issues raised today. Thanks very much for your attention and we look forward to speaking and engaging with you next time. Bye-bye.